This is the Eric John Phelps Show on 24-7 World Radio. And now, Eric John Phelps. Welcome on this Monday, September 24, 2018. This is Robert Dudley sitting in for Pastor Eric John Phelps on this uh, first day of autumn. Uh, the fall equinox was yesterday, Sunday, September 23rd. And today we have a special guest joining us uh, for both hours, Harrison Katz, uh, bringing us a little sunshine from the Sunshine State down there in Florida. And so we'd like to welcome Harrison. Harrison, you are you with us today? Yes, I am, Brother Robert. Good to be with you this morning. All right, great. Great to have you. Well, let me make a quick introduction for you and, and then have you uh, invite you to tell us a little bit about yourself. So, uh, okay. so Harrison is a Christian with a great deal of wisdom and, and insight and a real student of the Bible, what we like to refer to in the New Testament as a Berean, someone who searches the scriptures for themselves. Amen. And... Uh, you know, he's also a skilled tradesman, uh, much like the Apostle Paul was, who works with his hands. He provides for his wife and family there in Florida, and uh, he has a very interesting background, which I think God is using for good. Sometimes we don't all start out in, in a Christian environment, and yet God can use whatever experiences we have to when, when he draws us to Christ to give us even more insight on what's going on in the world. And uh, I think Harrison has a lot to offer in that regard. So Harrison, uh, take the floor and tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah, like you said, uh, I'm 30 years old. I am uh, married to my wife, Crystal, who is my high school sweetheart. Uh, we have an eight-year-old daughter, Annabelle. We, uh, we live, like you said, in the sunny state of Florida. Uh, I'm a tradesman. I do... HVAC work, which is like heating, air conditioning, refrigeration, stuff of that nature. And uh, in my spare time, I am an amateur researcher. And uh, I've been researching a lot of these topics for probably a good seven, eight years plus, but it's only been within the last five or six that I've been saved. And it's only through the grace of God that I've been able to come to so many truths in my studies, you know, of course. Uh, as you stated before, being diligent in reading God's Word and being diligent in prayer. And I just want to stress to a lot of the, uh, the younger men listening this morning that just as Brother Eric preaches on all the time, we must not be ashamed of Christ and we must not be ashamed to pray in Christ's name and to ask all things of the Lord because He is he's faithful to provide for us. So, and especially in the seeking of truth, because as the Lord sits on his throne, he's the Lord of equity. He's the Lord of righteousness. So if we petition him for discovery of truthful matters, you know, what's going on in the world, truthful, uh, the truth and in, 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 uh, our discernment in the Bible, and he is faithful to provide that as well. So I just want to encourage all listeners to, to uh, stand strong and keep praying. Because the Lord is working in the earth. I know it may not seem like he is because we are surrounded by so much evil and so much wickedness. But uh, we are encouraged to run the race. Run the whole race and not to quit and not to lie down and not to give up. So, Well, this is great. You know, I always love the Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And that's, yes. that's the case here uh, on 24-7 World Radio. I know... Uh, Pastor Phelps has had many guest speakers, and mm -hmm. we're all edified by them. Yes. So, uh, so we welcome you to the program today. Mention a little bit of your inspiration for being oh. on the radio with us. Um, yes. You know, you, you you've been a listener for some time, and mm -hmm. and you feel feel inspired specifically. So tell us about that. Yes. Uh, it it had to be uh, the beginning of September, maybe the end of August, when uh, Brother Lewis Heaney from from Manchester. Is that that's where he's from? Correct. Is that where he's, uh, he's from? What is it? Uh, it's a different city. I'm Not Manchester. To remember the name. It's, it's on the River Tyne. Right. Newcastle. He's Newcastle. From Newcastle. Right. I apologize for that, Brother Heaney. But yeah, uh, as as any listeners who who heard him on his bro on the broadcast, you know, he's only eighteen, and 
when I heard him come forward and speak up on live radio, which I must admit, you know, uh, it can be a little nervous, a little nerve wracking, you know, at first, but to hear him come forward with, you know, speaking truth and not being afraid, uh, it really, it really struck me. It said, here's this young man. He's only 18 years old, you know, out there. He's still in what we would consider high school in the States. And, you know, the, uh, he feels moved to come forward and speak on things. And so the Lord convicted me, you know what? I need to do the same thing. And uh, that is, he, he is a big part of my inspiration for coming forward and speaking on a lot of these things. So, uh, Brother Lewis, I would like to thank you. And I would like to encourage you also to uh, continue, continue your research and continue to uh, seek to speak truth and tell the truth. Hey Amen. Well, I think this is a great example of how we encourage each other. You know, we, we encourage by action, by example, mm -hmm. uh, as well as our words. So, uh, you know, this is a great format. This uh, internet radio program reaches a lot of people. It goes out to about 160 countries around the world. And uh, it's a great chance for us to network with other believers. Some of us feel isolated. Yes. Uh, you know, the church situations are not ideal in every place. So some of us are, are sitting in corners wondering where the rest of the believers are, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or let's say at least like-minded believers. Right. Uh, and, and so this is a great opportunity for us to share our studies and our personal experiences with each other. So... So welcome, Harrison, today. Today our topic, of course, is uh, we're, we're doing a special two-hour program together on the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, I thought just before I jump into that with Harrison, I'll mention a couple quick news updates because as you heard in the news announcement at the top of the hour, there are big things going on and Syria's back in the in the headlines at the top of the news there. Um, and so there's a whole lot going on. Well, I, I have a five quick bombshells to share with you <laughs> hopefully do them in just a couple minutes here uh but the first one is that uh tomorrow on september 25th in washington in new york city president trump is supposed to address the united nations and we believe it's on the topic of a middle east peace deal and this is something his administration has been working on for the last year and a half plus and there's been a lot of hype about it uh Jared Kushner's role and so forth, and uh, so we're going to watch that very closely. Um, and and I just want to mention that you know there's a controversy in these calendars. So today in Israel, Israel is celebrating the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and this is based on what is called the Hillel calendar. That calendar goes back to uh, the, the early centuries, and I. I'm personally learning that I think that calendar may be corrupted and, and, and in fact, historically corrupted by Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who was the shadow of the Antichrist, mm. right? And yes. he forced uh, Israel to change their calendar. And, and he was using a, a lunar calendar that he took from Babylon. And so Israel today is basically following this, what I think is a corrupted calendar, it's actually a Babylonian based, and and that kind of fits our whole uh, theme on this program about the role of the Jesuits in Rome. I mean, they're running the world, and here is Israel with a Zionist government that's dominated by the Pope. The Pope owns half the land in Jerusalem. He's pushing for this third temple, and a lot of the events that are being orchestrated, we believe, are being orchestrated behind the scenes by the Jesuits. And here, their holidays are going by this. I think corrupted calendar. Well, hmm. in the in the Bible, the way you tell a change of season is by one of the two equinoxes or one of the two solstices. So you can't fake those. So we just had the autumn equinox yesterday. This is when the sun begins to cross the equator and go south for the winter. So in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, the the day after. Uh, the equinox is a day of remembrance, and the following day begins the seventh month, and that would be tomorrow. So the first day of the seventh month is the day of Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, okay? And on that day tomorrow, President Trump is speaking before the UN about a peace deal in the Middle East. Now, I, I'm not predicting what the outcome of that's going to be, but I'm going to be watching that 
with my eyes bulging out because if, if this peace deal uh, creates a whole new uh, security system for the Middle East, and if they call it a seven-year uh, agreement, and if this is endorsed by the Pope of Rome, I think we're close to checking some boxes on this that, that Daniel talked about. Remember in Daniel uh, 9, uh, the 70th week of Daniel would be triggered by a, uh, uh, a contract or an agreement with many nations, and it would be endorsed by the Antichrist. So, so we're watching this pretty close. And, the, and part of the reason it's of additional interest is that it, it, my uh, understanding is that the 70th week of Daniel will end on the first day of the seventh month. And the reason why is because of these appointed holy days. Uh, Yom Teruah is the blowing of the trumpets, which I think will, will be fulfilled with the second coming of Christ. So if that is the case, that means it begins on Yom Teruah, because it's exactly seven years, 2,520 days. So this makes it a little precarious watching what's going on here tomorrow and with these dates. And of course, keep in mind, this is 70 years since the founding of Israel. So a lot of people are paying attention to that as well. And by the way, on that date is when uh, uh, Solomon was coronated by the priest Zadok and the prophet Nathan at the Gihon Springs at the city of David. Uh, and this is a symbol, uh, you know, he was David's son. Well, Jesus as the Messiah is David's son, and, and we believe he'll be coronated on his second return. That's when he takes the throne of David on the earth and fulfills the, the promise that David would have a son who would reign forever. Okay? Amen. This is in First Kings uh, 1, 32. You can read about the anointing of Solomon. Uh, so... So we're watching this pretty close. This is an interesting date to look at tomorrow. In addition, you heard the news today, and, and Israel has gone on DEF, DEFCON 3 about three days ago. That's their middle-range yellow alert status. So we know there's a lot of military movements in the region. Uh, Turkish troops, uh, Russian troops, Americans are faced off on, at the Euphrates River. So, so we're going to be keeping a close eye on that. I think it's also interesting that uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions recently went to the Supreme Court uh, to get special release from his recusal status. Uh, and uh, there are rumors that there are something like 50,000 sealed indictments prepared to be unsealed, which would be used as a major roundup of all the corruption that's going on in D.C., the so-called draining of the swamps. So. They're talking about springing this maybe October 3rd. That's about a week away. And on that same day, uh, they moved the date to that date. Now, FEMA is going to roll out the Presidential Emergency Alert Warning System. This has never been used before. This is where we're all going to get warnings on our cell phones from the president's office of a you know, potential, you know, any kind of national security threat. And some believe that Trump will act, may actually declare a national emergency at that time in relation to this rollout of, of the sealed indictment. So we have these multiple balls in the air at the same time. So it's, it's, it's quite precarious. Uh, a fourth r report that I've read, which is shocking to me, is that supposedly behind the scenes, the charter for the Federal Reserve Bank has been canceled as of about two weeks ago, and its functions transferred to the Treasury Department. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but I'm going to look into that further. And there's Absolutely. talk that the major central banks are secretly in meltdown as we speak. So I don't know, again, how accurate that is, but I'm going to check closely into that. So, again, you have a lot of things happen at one time. Now, this news came out over the weekend, and it was quite interesting. Uh, Trump has just closed the Washington, D.C. offices of the Palestinian Authority. And this is important this hasn't had they established diplomatic offices in 1994 and this has now been revoked they're, they're revoking their diplomatic status they're sending them out of the country and so what this is saying is that the palestinians are not going to be part of this agreement this agreement is going to be with jordan egypt saudi arabia israel the united states and the pope so let's watch where this all goes uh i think this is very important news so uh 
I'll, I'll let it go with that, and we'll switch gears here. Oh, uh, the- Brother Robert, if I could just give a little comment on what you were saying about oh, the, uh, yes, the timing of all this, and speaking of the calendars and everything, um, I, I just want to throw into the mix here the whole idea that the, the Jesuits have in, quote-unquote, establishing the kingdom. Okay, so it is very possible that all these dates are, you know, it, it, you know, of course, as you said, we need to keep an eye on them because they could be fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But at the same time, this could be the devil seeking to mock God in these things and give us f- uh, like almost a false fulfillment of prophecy. Okay. And I say that because if you look back at, uh, speaking of the calendar, the establishment of the Gregorian calendar in the late 16th century. Okay, the whole idea of them establishing the Gregorian calendar, uh, the Catholics claim was that they could establish Easter, which to them is the feast of Passover. Okay, it's their pagan version of Passover. So, what uh, to establish Easter, that's what they did. Now, if we look back at Exodus 12, all right, the Lord gave Moses the true biblical calendar and how to reconcile the days of the year so that he could establish Passover. All right. So you see this mocking of what what the Jesuits and namely Christopher Clavius and others did in establishing the Gregorian calendar so that they may establish their pagan feast days. It's just a mockery of what God did in his word. Mm-hmm. I so, agree. It's good yes. to to be on our toes, double check everything, cross check each other. Yes. You know, and see where deceptions lie. I think we may be coming up on our 20-minute break here in a moment. Okay. But uh, good point. Excellent point. And, and I love the sharing our humility together because mm-hmm. we're, we're all trying to be accurate. Yes. So when we look into different viewpoints, you know, we're doing it with, with uh, you know, a real sensitivity to mm-hmm. being open, to being corrected as we go along. So, uh, so today we're we're going to talk uh, from the perspective of the Hillel calendar, the uh, celebration which had began last night in Israel, Feast of Tabernacles. It's it's the third feast uh, appointed feast of the Hebrew year. There are three feasts. There are seven holy appointments throughout the year. Only three of them are treated as feasts. Uh, the first one being uh, unleavened bread in the spring. The second one being Pentecost around June. And this one is the final one. This is considered the big one and the most joyous one. So we're going to go into this in details. If our if our break doesn't uh, kick in here, hopefully uh, hopefully we're on the air. <laughs> uh, so uh, we must be because we heard the the news at, at the top of the hour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, these are called uh, in Hebrew moads, that and it me- literally means appointments and rehearsals. So the reason the, we study these and the reason they're so important, God set these in stone. These are to be repeated over and over throughout history, and they're designed to teach us what what the meanings of them are and then to actually have a final prophetic fulfillment at a certain point in history. And we know the first half have already been fulfilled in, in the, the week of Christ's passion. Mm-hmm. They were fulfilled on the exact day, in the exact order, with the full meaning that their prophecies indicated. And that's why we're looking at these last three in the same way. We know that their dates are meaningful and the, and what their fulfillments are uh, illustrated through the holidays from history past. So uh, Harrison's going to walk us through this from three perspectives. He, he We were talking the other day and he made an excellent point. He said, you know, you can look at all these from three different angles. So why don't you talk about that a little bit, Harrison? Okay, yes. Um, let, first, I want to start in the in the book of Galatians, it tells us that the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Okay, so just as you said, these rehearsals were all centered around the Hebrew Messiah all centered around Christ and what Christ would do. All right, and as we see in Hebrews, the uh, Hebrews 13, verse 8, it tells us that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Okay, and I just, the idea of this, of what we're going to go through today is quite simple. We're going to be looking at the study of threes in the Bible. As Brother Eric has mentioned before, a lot of things in the Bible come in threes. Now, let's go back over this verse and count them. Jesus Christ, the same one, yesterday, two, today, and forever, three. So that's, we could literally take that as past the present time, which would be, you know, the, uh, the time of Christ's ministry. So past, present, and then into the future, which is the coming, uh, which is Christ's second coming. And if we think about these feasts in that manner as a past, present, and future fulfillment in all three, I think we can glean a lot of understanding uh, about what's really going to be happening in the book of Revelation, as is described, and how it's not just a... It's actually a retelling of what God did for the, the Israelitish people in bringing them out of Egypt, he is also going to do some uh, very similar in bringing them once again to himself in the latter day, okay? You know, because as we know, we distinguish between the church, the body of Christ, and Israel in the scriptures. We distinguish between those two. So, if we read in Jeremiah chapter 31, it talks about this right around verses 31 and through 33, it talks about a new covenant that God will make with Israel. Okay, and not that it's the a brand new covenant as I believe you talked about the other day. It's it's the same it's the old branches being grafted back in to the tree. Okay? So how much if if the wild branches which are us the gentiles are able to be grafted in, how much more the natural branches to be grafted back in? Right. Great point. That's yes. so critical because there's a lot of debate among Christians, you know, where, how does Israel fit back in? Um, the, the, now, there are multiple covenants in the Old Testament. There's mm -hmm. about five covenants that God has made. Right. You know, he made one with Noah. He made one with Abraham. Mm -hmm. He made one with David. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, the, the Mosaic Covenant is what we're referring to here. Yes, the Mosaic yes. Covenant was the covenant of the law, yes. which he received on Mount Sinai. And it was conditional, okay? Some covenants are unconditional. We even have this today in business, right? Yes. So so there, the, these are uh, stipulations within the fine print of, of an agreement, of a contract. Right, so, being a, a, so a, uni, a unilateral contract, which is just one-sided, or a bilateral contract, which was right. what the Mosaic covenant was. The Lord that's gave right. them this, this law, and, and then they swore to him that they would follow every statute and every command. So they, therefore, it was offer and acceptance. They accepted right. it. And, and, that, and we would look back on that now and say that was kind of a setup, and this was the school lesson, right? You can't right. keep the law. The whole point of the law is to show us our sin nature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it becomes the measure of how far we short, fall short from God's uh, holiness. And so what's the alternative? Well, God created a new covenant, and that's Jeremiah 30. And this is on our hearts, not on stone, like the tablets that Moses had. And the, and we read about this last week in Hebrews. This covenant is permanent. The other covenant was temporary. It was actually called a weak covenant compared to the new one. The hmm. new one is far superior because it lasts forever, and it's not it's not conditional. When we turn to Christ, he covers our sins, even if we're unfaithful in following him as, as we promise we will, right? Mm -hmm. So go, go ahead then, and, uh, okay. and let's relate this to the historic uh, example of the Feast of Tabernacles then. Uh, go ahead and tell us where, you know, where did, why was this instituted and what, what was it designed to do in history for the Jews? Oh, uh, you mean specifically the the Feast of Tabernacles? That is right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, the the Feast of Tabernacles, um, the Feast of Tabernacles actually had it was it was almost two parts because the Feast of Tabernacles is also referred to in the scriptures as the Feast of Ingathering, which that word ingathering means harvest. It was the Feast of the of the harvest because at the end, it was at at the end of their uh, I guess what what is referred to as their religious calendar. And also, it was harvest time, so they were gathering in uh, all the wheat into their barns. And it was after this harvest that they built themselves tents or sukkahs or booths 
and they would rejoice in the Lord for all that he did for them throughout the whole year. All their harvest, all their blessings, you know, this was after the Day of Atonement, so the sins of, of all of Israel for the year were forgiven. So, like you said before, it was a time of rejoicing. It was a, uh, oh, as you could also think of it, almost as a time of rest as well, because they were, they were, uh, they were you know, as we know, Jesus Christ is our rest, and they were looking forward to that, to the coming of Christ, their King, when he would give them rest from all their enemies round about them. So, uh, in fact, in fact, the first day is treated as a Sabbath, and it forbids any work. Mm -hmm. So the har there's no harvesting going on during this festival. The harvesting yeah. has already been accomplished, right? And now they're they're relaxing and enjoying the fruits of the harvest. Right, right, right. So we all, uh, and the whole idea of of this being being thought about in threes. Okay, so let's look at the past fulfillment. Of the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, it, when we read in Scripture, it talks about how Joshua, Joshua, when he brought the Israelites into the land, that I believe it's the first time recorded in the Bible that the Israelites um, celebrated, according to God's word, the Feast of Tabernacles right, once they came correct. into the land. Okay, that's so correct. if you look at that, that's a them coming into the land, you know, of course, at the time, they were traveling through the wilderness, so they were living in tents already, you know, as uh, I guess you could say that their nomadic lifestyle. So let's look at that as a path fulfillment. Then, of course, you have the fulfillment uh, presently, or we should say in Christ's time, because Christ came, and Christ tabernacled with us in the flesh. He had his fleshly tabernacle among us. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we look at that as the second fulfillment or the present fulfillment in the time of Christ. Now, let's look towards the future. The future fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, and I believe we discussed this a little bit when we spoke the other day, Brother Robert, that if you look at that word, the Feast of Ingathering or the Feast of Harvest, let's take that idea of the harvest and let's go to the book of Matthew. Uh, chapter 13, and let's start at verse 29. We'll start there. Or, yeah, verse 29. Start there. All right, and this is, this is Christ, uh, of course, speaking of the parable of the wheat and the tares. And this is actually still in the parable. This is not the explanation of it, but let's start with this. Verse 29, but he said, nay. Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Alright, and so that's the parable. And if we go down to verse 39... He gives us the explanation of what this, the literal meaning of this parable is. In verse, uh, Matthew 13, verse 39, The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So we see this, that, that Christ is telling us that there will be a great harvest, and it will be much like the harvest of that is described in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, it's going to be exactly like it, I maintain. And uh, this is just one example. Uh, Brother Robert, did you want me to kind of go over through some of these other feast days and just give people an idea of how this, this goes on throughout Scripture? Well, let, let me uh, throw in another verse along the same line. It's in mm -hmm. Matthew 3. And let me get my reference straight here. Um, it's fairly similar, but I think the listeners will totally uh, relate to this. It's mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. So let me read this from the King James. Uh, skip down here. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John the Baptist, I believe, speaking. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and that word actually means a pitchfork, <laughs> and he will thoroughly purge his floor. That's a reference to the threshing floor. 
where the so. wheat is separated from the chaff. Mm-hmm. And he will gather his wheat into the garner, which is a barn, mm-hmm. but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Amen. Okay, so this is the same reference I concept that you're giving in Matthew. Absolutely 13. it is, yes. Matthew 3. So go ahead uh, with whatever you want to okay. talk about now. Okay, well, well that, that's the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, but what about the other feasts? So we see these three references throughout Scripture of a past, uh, present time, or you should you, you could look at it as Christ's day fulfillment, and then a future fulfillment. Well, let's start in the beginning. Uh, well, firstly, l- actually, let me start here. Uh, as we know, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, it talks about that uh, in, in the Millennial Kingdom, that the people... The whole world will have to go to Jerusalem to worship Christ our King on the Day of Tabernacles, and those who don't won't get any rain. Okay, right. so it so therefore we know that the will be there will be a Feast of Tabernacles that is being celebrated in the Millennial Kingdom. But is that the only one? Now, <clears throat> let's if you go to the Book of Ezekiel. In chapter 45, and I believe it's it's Ezekiel 40 or 41 through, how many books are in Ezekiel? Through the end of Ezekiel, I think it's 48. Mm-hmm. One second. Yeah, so chapters 40 or 41 through 48 is, is explicitly speaking of the future temple. Mm-hmm. Okay, everything in that chapter from the design of the temple, but when you get to chapter 45, it goes into the different, to, to, to specific holy days or feast days that are to be uh, celebrated at that same time during the millennial reign of Christ. And let's look at that, that Ezekiel 45. And if we look at verse, verse 21, it tells us, In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month, ye shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. Okay, so... Let's, so let's add on to our understanding. So we have the very first feast, which is mentioned, which is Passover and unleavened bread. And then also, later in the same chapter, Ezekiel also mentions the very last verse, verse 25, In the seventh month, in the fifteenth day of the month, shall he do the like in the feast of seven days. Well, that feast of seven days is the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. Right, it begins okay. on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, That's and it right. runs for a week. That's right. So, so here in Ezekiel forty-five, we have both the first feast and then the very last feast, which are and. But what about all the ones in between? Well, from my study, I believe that this is not explicitly explicitly stated in the Bible, but through study and, of course, as you stated before, being a Berean. Comparing scripture with scripture, line upon line, verse upon verse, here a little, there a little. That you can come to a logical, or I should say a biblical conclusion about this. And you don't have to look anywhere else. You just have to have the discernment to navigate God's word. That's it. That's all we need. So, let's uh, let's start with the book of Passover. I mean, I'm sorry, with uh, the feast of Passover. Now... The book of Exodus, as I, me- as I mentioned this chapter before, chapter 12, in verse 11, it says, And thus shall you eat it with your loins, well, huh, thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. In verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So here you have the past. I mean, fulfillment really isn't the right word, but it's the memorial. The whole reason that God says that he gave the Israelites the Passover to to always remember was to remember this literal event. To always keep it in remembrance. And so that every time that they would they would have this celebration, they would remember what the Lord did for them in Egypt. And then also looking forward to the coming fulfillments. Mm -hmm. So there you have the past, or the memorial of it, or the past fulfillment of Passover. 
So right. there's multiple layers to this. That, yes. And we're taught in the book of Psalms to remember things, right? Remember mm-hmm. what God's done for us. It's easy for us to get discouraged sometimes because right. we're, we're going through tough times. But part of the way to deal with that is to remember that God didn't forsake us in the past. He's helped us over different issues in our lives, and he'll help us going forward. So remembering is a, is a way of encouraging ourselves. And this feast does that. This, this is a way to remember coming out of bondage, which Amen. for us is like salvation, right? We've mm-hmm. been delivered from the slavery to sin, right? And Absolutely. so we need to remember how God has, has turned our lives around and passed over us in judgment, right? We've passed Amen. from death to life already, right? We now, we're now in, transferred from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of his beloved son. Amen. And, and we see that as the, the present day, or I would say that the day of Christ, that fulfillment, or you could say the second fulfillment of Passover was, was in Christ. Christ, Passover. our Passover lamb. I mean, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 7, it says right there, Christ, our Passover lamb. So you have two fulfillments there. The, the memorial of it in the book of Exodus, you have the second fulfillment in Christ himself as our Passover lamb. But what about the future? Well, I find it very interesting that in the book of Revelation, that the, the vision of John, the future vision of John, starts in chapter 5, right? Now, chapter 6, of course, is the beginning of the judgments, but in chapter 5, it tells us the pre- what happens before the judgments are unsealed. And the main focus of chapter 5 is Christ, the Lamb of God, in heaven. There you have it, our Passover Lamb in heaven. It shows us, you know, uh, it shows Christ in heaven, and then come the judgment, then literal the, the, the Passover or the judgment upon the world, which is the unsealing of the seals. Right. So well, you, you, yeah. Sorry for interrupting. You remember when uh, when Jesus spoke of his death, Peter got upset and he said, Never. It's not I'm not gonna let this happen. Mm-hmm. And Jesus rebuked him, right? Because right. Jesus said, you know, he had to suffer and die. It was to fulfill his role as the Passover lamb. If he didn't do that, we would have no salvation. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So God has wants us to remember how he's fulfilled his promises, how he's delivered us. In a way, we're traveling through the desert. Mm-hmm. Our, our life in this world is a desert to us. The scripture says we don't belong to this world. And if we love the world too much, the love of the Father is not in us. We're just passing through. There's a great Christian song about that. You know, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? <laughs> right? Amen. So we don't want to get too attached here. And right. we need to think of how God is delivering us miraculously through this wilderness. And he's feeding us with bread from heaven. He's feeding us with miracle food like they got in the desert. And it's the scriptures, okay? Without the scriptures, our minds can't be transformed, and we get sucked into this world, and we have no reference beyond this world without the Bible. Amen. Uh, that's why part, a lot of people don't can't relate to how we think because they're, you know, they're caught up in a worldly perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would even call it a a uh, a world uh, philosophy. And here we have outside information coming down from heaven, <laughs> giving right. us true insight. Right, the truth. Right. Amen. So God, so God's delivering us, and we just like the, the children of Israel. And by mm. the way, maybe Harrison, you could mention. I think in talking to you, it sounds like you have some Jewish uh, connection in your family history, which kind of adds to the beauty of your salvation in Christ. <laughs> right. Um, your your your. To some degree, Jewish, I think. Uh, I, I believe so. Um, I have not done a lot of the ancestral work as far as on my father's side. Um, obviously, with the last name Katz, um, you know, that is kind of just rings as Semitic. But I I don't know. So it's very possible. I know that they were practicing my on my father's side. Uh, my paternal grandparents were practicing Jews. But again, I've never met them. I don't know much about his side of the family. So it's as of right now, it's really kind of just speculation on my part. So right, yeah. right, right, right. I think you mentioned your grandfather was from Baltimore. Yes, yeah, <laughs> which I thought yeah. was interesting because I've I spent a fair amount of time in Baltimore. 
and uh, and I've had some interesting connections to the Jewish community there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a strong Jewish community in Baltimore, and they're very involved in a lot of the medical fields, yeah, and uh, and and legal fields. Most of them are very professional and and do pretty well there. So. Uh, Interesting family connection to Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So one other point about this feast, this feast, it says that it would be celebrated in the place of God's choosing. Mm-hmm. It, it, and, and you were accurate when you said it was first celebrated after they crossed the Jordan River under Joshua's leadership and entered into the Promised Land. And the place of God's choosing, that's sort of a euphemism and we know today that that refers to Jerusalem. So right. today, in order to celebrate that feast, you have to go to Jerusalem to do it. Right, the, meaning uh, you're, you're speaking of the Feast of Tabernacles now. Right, right, uh-huh. right. Right. Uh-huh. right. right. Well, well, it's it's also very interesting, brother, that you read in Deuteronomy 16.16 16 and other places that three times a year, again, another three, three times a year, every male Hebrew was to be, if they could, if it was physically possible, they were to report and be at Jerusalem for the three for the three main feasts: the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, or as we know today as Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. Right, and think think of think of the uh, the reasoning behind that. If you were alive at the time of Christ and you followed this, and you would have been in Jerusalem when Jesus presented Himself as the Messiah mm-hmm. on, uh, on the triumphal entry, which, by the way, was prophesied to the day by Daniel. Amen. Right? So you could have been there if you had followed this, you know, to, to show up as, as, as uh, encouraged to do so. Mm-hmm. You would have been present for these events. What, a, what an incredible experience. Right. And then same, same thing for Pentecost. If you were there, you would have heard the message because it was on Pentecost when they spoke in many foreign languages, and all these people came from outside of Israel, from all over the Mediterranean. These were Jews who had been scattered across the Roman world. And they took all this time and trouble to travel all the way to Jerusalem. And look at the payoff. If, they, if you made that trip and you were there, you would have heard the gospel <laughs> in your own language, miraculously. Yeah. Right. So it pays to follow these. Now, the third one is the same thing. To be in Jerusalem when this third one is fulfilled means you're going to see the consummation of the ages. That's how it's going to evolve here at the end of the tribulation period. Uh, but let me throw one other thing at you that's kind of interesting. We're mm-hmm. talking about uh, um, Passover. Um, we know that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years, mm-hmm. right? And we know it ended the week of Passover, right, mm-hmm. upon his death. So if you back up three and a half years on, on, a, on a Hebrew calendar, it lands on the, day, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we even know the year. We, we know he died in 33 AD. Mm-hmm. It, it was April, uh, uh, it was the 14th of Nisan, the 14th of the first month. And so if you back that up, it comes out to uh, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles in 29 AD. So imagine that his ministry began on the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a picture of him pitching his tent among us. He's, right. he's, go, he's going public. And you know where it happened? It happened when he was baptized by John down uh, near the Jordan River, near a place called Gilgal, which is where Joshua crossed over, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's when God's Spirit was poured out on him to begin his ministry. And part of Passover, or part of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, is it, the final fulfillment is that God will pour out His Spirit on Israel. Right, the latter right. rain. That's right. It'll be the later rain, and they'll have they will, He will turn their sorrow to joy. And that's what this was. That's what Tabernacles is about. That going right. through the wilderness was sorrowful. Right. But crossing the river and coming into the promised land, now their joy begins. Now they get their inheritance. It's a picture of going to heaven. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I want to bring this point up too, brother Robert. While we're talking about this, it's this idea of uh, as you, I like the way you put it. The pendulum is swinging back from the Gentiles back to the Jews. Okay, that's and, and that's right. And we need to we need to to keep this in mind when I'm especially when trying to understand what I'm going over here, and 
in these this this third future fulfillment of all the, of these feasts, it's to the Jews. It's just as when God was bringing them out of Egypt in the book of Exodus, it, it says in the scriptures that, you know, the Jews require a sign, okay? And that he gave them signs. He gave them signs and miracles and great wonders, okay? And that these feast days, most of them were established in remembrance of them. Well, the, what, what I'm putting forth here is that the future feast days that will be celebrated in the millennial kingdom will be remembrances of the events that take place in the book of Revelation. Okay, and again, to the Jews. To the Jews, because this is God's turning to the Jews once again, and him, just as he brought them out of Israel, we shall see that he's going to bring them out of this, uh, bringing them out of the world, if you will, or the uh, the reign of you know when anti antichrist is right. is upon the earth. So I I, I loved your comment about the um, you know, regrafting them in. Mm -hmm. The context in Romans eleven is for us as as Gentiles to not become uh, proud and overly um, arrogant about the fact that God has been shown his grace to us, right? Right. Because it's because he says, okay, he's we only have salvation because of God's grace. And it came through the Jews. All mm -hmm. the scriptures came through them. The Messiah came through them. Right. You know, Jesus is Jewish. But he turned to the Gentiles. Now, but then he has the right to turn back. And he will. Absolutely. And he will do that near the end. And the whole focus of the tribulation is going to be on the Jews. That's why it's called the day of Jacob's trouble. Amen. This is this is putting the final squeeze on them to to uh, call out to him whom they pierced. That's right. And and, and the scripture says then they will look on him when he comes back. They will look on him. They'll see his scars and they'll weep for him as as an only son. And they'll realize they were mistaken. And it's because there is a blindness on them temporarily, you know. And Paul talked about it. Now Paul was Jewish. And he was the exception to the rule. He was blinded, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, you know, he was physically blinded in the process of, of, of being uh, converted to, to Christ on his road to Damascus. And I think I mentioned something about that the other day because that, that actual point that he was traveling on is a major focal point of this coming Syrian war. It's, it's the Golan Heights. He traveled up through Nazareth where Jesus was born and grew up, the Galilee region, and he crossed up into the high country there called the Golan and, and entered into Damascus. Well, before he got to the city, Christ appeared to him and blinded him, <laughs> which right. is a picture of his spiritual condition. Right, 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 right. And he told them, you're fighting against me. It's kind of hard, isn't it? You know, you might want to give up. And so he went into the city and he became a Christian and the blinders were taken off. Well, Israel today has blinders, but God has plans uh, for a remnant to be changed. Amen. Oh. Amen. Um, okay, so uh, I can get into the next feast, well, actually, which is the same. So, of course, with Passover, you have uh, associated with that. So Passover is the one day. You have the Passover <laughs> feast, the Passover lamb is slain. Okay, and then the very next day starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, now the memorial of this for the Jews was again outlined in, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 17, and it says, And ye shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day and your generations by an ordinance forever. And... So we see that. So unleavened bread was the memorial of him, of the Lord bringing the Jews out of Egypt after the Lord passed over and killed all the Egyptian force, uh, firstborn. Okay, so their their fling was actually God taking them out. All right, and we see that in Exodus chapter nineteen and verse four, speaking of that same that same event. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now that's a very interesting phrase there, bear you on eagles' wings, because if we look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, all right, speaking of this very time, 
which I believe is speaking of, uh, well, speaking of a future day, which would be the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel. Let's see, 12, 14. All right, speaking of the woman who is Israel, okay, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Okay, and then in verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now, that imagery should evoke in your mind the story of Exodus, the story of the Israelites. So you have the Passover, you have the Lord bringing the Israelites out of Egypt unto himself, bearing them on eagles' wings, and then, of course, they come to the Red Sea, the crossover on dry land, and all of Pharaoh's uh, chariots and Pharaoh himself are tossed into the into the waters, tossed into the deep. All right, and, and are killed. Well, we see that same that same uh, guide or guideline, if you will, running through Revelation twelve verses fourteen and fifteen. Again, the Lord takes the people out of actually this time it's he's taken them out of Jerusalem. Which is, I, which is also referred to as spiritual Egypt in other parts of the Bible. He takes them out of Jerusalem, delivers them, bears them again on eagles' wings, and then he, of course, consumes the flood that the devil sends after them, and that it says that the earth swallows these floods of waters. So, again, you, you, you see this imagery, all right? And if so, so, of course, the, uh, the memorial of it would be the past, the present day or the Christ day fulfillment of unleavened bread is Christ himself. Christ is our unleavened bread, leaven being likened to sin. He is the bread of heaven. He is without leaven. I mean, it is, uh, it's pretty clear that Christ, Christ fulfilled this. And then, of course, you have this future fulfillment, which will be a memorial in the millennial kingdom to the Israelites of, again, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread established by different signs, or I should say, I mean, they're the same, but they're different. It's, it's, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They follow mm -hmm. the same pattern and the same type. Because, right. again, I, we, have to, we always have to keep this in mind. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's not just him, just as a man and God, okay? This is also, I believe this, this verse is also talking about how he deals with the Israelitish people. You know, he's the same. He's not going to change it. It's going to be the same. It's going to be, a, you know, he's got a better covenant for them, but he's got to, once again, bring them out of Egypt unto himself. Right. Well, and you're right about shadows and types. Uh, and this is all part of the school lessons that you yes. referred to yes. originally. This is how the Jewish people are, are supposed to be learning from their own scriptures their way to the Messiah mm -hmm. and get it correct. I, I was reading in the Gospels over the weekend, and there was a comment uh, when Jesus began his ministry. Some of the naysayers were saying, oh, he's from Nazareth. There, there's, there's no prophet that, in the Bible that we're supposed to expect from Nazareth. And, and they lost the fact that he was born in Bethlehem, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and then other people did pick up on that. They're like, oh, he's from Bethlehem, and that is, you know, Micah 5, too. Right. By the way, so, and we know Bethlehem means the house of bread. This was the, the town from, that David was born in, mm -hmm. and, and David's the type of Christ, right? Amen. Uh, and, and, and Christ is uh, pictured as the bread that comes down out of heaven. That's mm -hmm. referring to the manna that God sent to the children of Israel in the wilderness because they had no food. That's right. So he, he gave them water from the rock, and he gave them food from heaven. And, and I, I think it's also very day. interesting, Brother Robert, I hate to cut you off like that, but also in that same respect, it was Christ who was the angel of the Lord that was going out before the Israels, right. Israelites. That was, that was the pre-incarnate Christ. Okay, That was right. Christ in right. his role as the captain of the host of heaven as described in, in the book of Joshua, I believe it's chapter 15. Right. And okay. that's part of the remembrance of the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. The, the, the miracles that happened, they were had the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that's right. to direct them and protect them. 
and that was Christ, right? So these are all leading them, knowing their history and remembering should lead them to the true Messiah. That's right, a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ, amen. Right, right. So we're coming up uh, in about two minutes on the hour break, and we'll see if we hear the news. <laughs> okay, yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear any of the other uh, commercials, but hey, uh, let me, let me, can I get, give out my information? Sure, go ahead. To any listener out there, any researcher, uh, anyone who, who, who is seeking to network with other like-minded individuals and Christians and seek to actually do something, trying to organize something, you know, if you want to reach out to me and just talk, uh, you can reach me at my email. It is 727facebook at gmail.com. So that's 727facebook at gmail.com. All right, and you can email me any comments, you have questions, you want to share any research. Let's network, let's, uh, let's communicate with one another, and let's try to build a network of like-minded individuals. That's great, and that's Harrison Katz, K-A-T-Z, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, Harrison, appreciate it. What a great first hour. Hopefully uh, we're, on, we're, we're on track here with the news coming up, and then we'll come back for a second hour, mm-hmm. and we'll, we'll deal a little bit more with this, and if we have a little extra time, uh, maybe we'll get into a, a subject that you're working on and researching that okay. uh, will be developed more extensively in a future program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that sounds good. So let's just stand by and see if we get the news here at the turn of the hour. Uh, so Pastor Phelps should be back on Wednesday. Uh, he's returning uh, to Pennsylvania today, I believe, and so keep praying for him and look forward to his report of what he's been doing, and, and we look forward to his return shortly. Okay, well, let's start the second hour here. This is Robert Dudley in for Pastor Phelps, and uh, I'm with uh, Brother Harrison Katz out of Florida, and we're, I think we might have blown the first hour, we're not sure, <laughs> but uh, it's okay, we'll, we'll learn as we go. And we, our topic today was the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, which has begun in Israel uh, today on September 23rd um, under the Hillel calendar, their, their uh, Jewish calendar that they use today. Uh, so I thought I'd start this hour by reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 26, uh, which is a, an interesting psalm that I think relates well to uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. So let me just read this uh, real quick. It's only uh, a handful of verses. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency, so will I compass your altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving. This is the theme of Feast of Tabernacles. It's celebration and thanksgiving. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwells. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. And as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. Psalm 26. So the Feast of Tabernacles is a gathering. It's it's an ingathering of believers. This is the harvest of the wheat as opposed to the tares. The tares are, are burned, right? That's judgment. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the wheat is brought in to, to God's barn in, in the end days. This is the consummation of the age, the end of the tribulation period, and where uh, the remnant of Israel is redeemed. Uh, they've been saved, uh, even escaping out to the desert on the wings of eagles and then being brought back into Jerusalem when the Messiah comes to Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14. That's right. Amen. So, uh, so Brother Katz, uh, you want to make a couple comments, uh, kind of encapsulating what we've covered in the first hour, even though yeah. we may have missed the broadcast. Yeah, part. right. We, we may have not been on the air, and we apologize for the, the little technical difficulties we've had, but 
to sum it up, just as Brother Roberts said, there is a future fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. And as we know from Zechariah 14, that in the Millennial Kingdom, that all, all people... Not just not just Jews, not just you know all people will be going to the uh, city of Jerusalem to worship the King, to worship Jesus Christ our Lord, as and uh, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, my whole the whole premise that I bring forth to this is the whole idea that the Lord is going to do this in threes. So we started in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 and it speaks of Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, if we think about that, not just Christ as the man and as God, but also as Christ dealing with the Israelitish people. He, he's gonna, he dealt with them the same yesterday, he's going to deal with them the same today, and then in the future, at the future swinging of the pendulum back from the Gentiles to the Jewish people during the latter reign, where the Lord is going to once again turn to the Jewish Israelitish people and seek to be their God, and He be their people, and He dwell among them, as it is uh, as it is written in the Scriptures. So, just as in the Feast of Tabernacles, you have a future fulfillment, a uh, a past fulfillment, and a fulfillment that Christ literally fulfilled. While he was here on the earth, tabernacling, tabernacling, tabernacling. I don't know how you would say that with us here, right. and we can see that also in in another in another uh, feast that Ezekiel chapter forty five tells us that we will also be celebrating in the millennial kingdom the feast of Passover. Okay, the feast of Passover and unleavened bread. So the Passover, of course, was in memorial to the uh, the Passover that happened in Egypt. The Lord literally passing over Egypt and killing all the firstborn. Okay, and we, we so we and that was the memorial that the Jews were to remember when they would celebrate this day. Up until the time of Christ. Okay, because the law was a schoolmaster to lead the Jews to Christ. So when Christ came, of course, Christ is our Passover lamb. All right, so then again, you have this uh, this past fulfillment, a, a present day and Christ day fulfillment, and then yet a future fulfillment of this very same day, uh, feast of Passover, as you see in Revelation uh, chapter five, before any before any judgments are set. Okay, the, the the future vision starts in chapter five. Okay, that that John sees, and the main figure of chapter five is the Lamb. It's the Lamb of God in heaven, our Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ in heaven, who's the only one who can even look upon the scrolls, let alone unseal them. Okay, so he's the main feature. So you again, just as just hearkening back unto the book of Exodus, you see the Lamb of God, and then come the judgments. Just as in you had the sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice, and then the Lord passing over Egypt. Well, and you remember when Jesus began his earthly ministry, uh, I believe it occurred on the Feast of Tabernacles mm -hmm. when he was baptized by John. By the way, John was a uh, of, of the Levitical priest. His father had been a priest in Jerusalem in the temple. And so he was uh, a, 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 of a priestly line, and he baptized Christ to fulfill the law on the Feast of Tabernacles uh, and then he turned to the disciples and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Well, right away, he attributed Christ as the fulfillment of the Passover. Amen. Right? That that's who he, you were looking at. If you're seeing him walk by, make the connection. He's going to be the Passover Lamb. Amen. Yeah. And then also, I mean, because so you have the Feast of Passover, which was the one day. And then the, then the following week was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right, now that was memorialized in, again in the book of Exodus chapter 12 as the Lord taking them out of Egypt, literally. Like, so they had the Passover in, 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 uh, in the time of the Exodus. They slaughtered the lamb, they shed the blood, they, sh uh, they, they, uh, they put the blood on the, the doorpost. The Lord passed over them. Okay, the judgments, uh, his judgment was not was not uh, in, uh, acted upon them, and then the very next morning, and they were told to to 
you know, to be ready. Have your shoes and your staff in your hand because the next day I'm taking you out of here. And that's exactly what the Lord did. And in uh, the book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 17, it talks about him. Uh, it, talks, it, it speaks about this. And that's, that's the verse that gives us the memorial. But also in the book of Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, it talks about the Lord taking them out on eagle's wings. When he did this, when the Lord brought the, the Israelites out of Egypt, he brought them out on eagle's wings. Well, that phrase, as we know, is, is very similar to the phrase we see in Revelation 12, which is speaking of that same, that same or the time period of the mid-70th week of Daniel, okay, when the Lord would... would uh, has it says that the Lord prepared a place for the woman who was Israel, and that He would keep the keep her there for a time, time and half a times, which is three and a half years, and that He would bear her on eagle's wings to bring her there. All right, and we can see that this again would be a a future memorial for the Israelites, the Hebrew Jewish Israelites, as those natural branches are grafted back in to the tree, to the tree of life, if you will. Okay, so we as we as wild olive branches, if we can be grafted in, how much more can the natural branches? Right. You know, so of course you know the Lord. Uh, the Lord tells us that the Jews require a sign. Okay, the Jews require a sign. So that's exactly what He's going to give them. Just as in the Exodus, He gave them these literal events that happened to memorialize what He did to them. In his once again turning to them, he's going to do the same thing in the book, as, as described in the book of Revelation. He's going to once again bring them out of spiritual Egypt, which is Jerusalem. He's going to bring them out, bear them up on eagles' wings, and then he's also going to protect them from the flood, as it's stated in Revelation 12, 15, as, the earth shall, as Satan shall, shall cast forth his flood to, to, uh, to engulf them, and, and the earth shall swallow it. And you see the very similarities between that and the uh, the Israelites crossing the Red Sea on dry land. And then, of course, the floods engulfing Pharaoh and his chariots. So, Right. There's also a double side to this uh, picture of Jesus being the, the Lamb of God. He's also illustrated as being the shepherd of Israel, mm -hmm. which is sort of the other side of a picture, right? Right. So, so he was born... In the springtime, when when the sheep are born, right? And I actually believe he was born on the first day of the first month. So that would have been Nisan one, and uh, which is kind of symbolic of beginning the year for for Israel. And uh, the the shepherds were out in the field, and so there's this picture of shepherds, you know, welcoming the great shepherd of the sheep. He's called in the New Testament the great shepherd of the sheep. All right, he's he's our shepherd. Amen. Well, the 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 negative side to that is that the devil wants to become Israel's shepherd. He wants to replace Christ. So the scriptures actually predict that, that because they rejected Christ as a as a nation that God would eventually send them a false shepherd. Mhm. Mm okay? And so I actually think let me throw this out there it's something to chew on that i think uh the the devil is is pretty smart he knows the scriptures pretty well and he's going to try and duplicate everything christ did so so christ came at the end of the 69 uh heptods is what it says in daniel these uh periods of seven year chunks times 69 was 483 years from the announcement by Artaxerxes to rebuild the city of Jerusalem to the triumphal entry was precisely 483 years to the day, right? Well, I think the devil's trying to pull the same thing, and it's something to think about. So 483 years ago, uh, the sultan of the Ottoman Empire uh, uh, gave an order in, in 1535 to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem. Well, that's what Artaxerxes did. So we see the parallel. Well, the walls that surround the old city of Jerusalem today are those walls. Okay, exactly. They're, they're, it's 2.4 2 miles around. They're about 40 feet high, about 8 feet thick. And those are the very walls that were ordered to be built 
by Suleiman the Magnificent in 1535, and that's 483 years ago. And here we are on the first day of the seventh month tomorrow, which uh, Trump's going to make his big announcement, possibly a major peace uh, message about Israel. So I'm wondering, I'm, I'm just putting on my high alert hat here and wondering, is this the, the false, uh, the devil's false fulfillment? And then he's going to, instead of bringing the king of kings, which Jesus was, he brings the false shepherd, the Antichrist, who puts his, his guarantee and his seal of approval on this false covenant, and he triggers Daniel's 70th week. Okay, I think we should be watching these events, and the parallels are exact, even to the day, right? Yes. So, so this is something to be paying attention to. We know the devil is the great counterfeiter. That's right, and we also know that his his henchmen, his first cause in the earth, the Jesuit order, seeks to establish the king, uh, the kingdom, as those heretics like to say. They they think that doing the evil of the devil will actually. Uh, hasten the book of revelation okay it'll right. actually hasten by them doing these things and act because you there the dualism in the jesuit order is it there's a reason why why they're referred to as janus okay as the uh the old the old uh deity janus who had two heads okay it was dualistic just like you have the black pope and the white pope there's this right. dualism that runs throughout this Jesuit order, likened unto the priests of Baal and the priest of Astroth. Okay, you have this masculine and this feminine. The same way with the Jesuit order, how they, were, how they, they venerate Mary and baby Jesus. You have this masculine and this feminine. Okay, so within this duality, they believe that, yeah, they can do their good works, all their charity and their so-called good works that they proclaim and, you know, that most of the world knows them for. But behind the scenes, what they're really doing is seeking to hasten the judgment of God upon the world. Right, and we were talking about that on the phone the other day. So God allows the devil. Let me let me let me throw this out there. When Jesus was crucified, what role did the devil play in that? He led the events. He set it up. He entered Judas' heart. Mm -hmm. Right. He worked through the Pharisees, and God let him do it. God let him do it in order to fulfill the prophecies and bring us salvation. So, so when we look at what's going on today, we attribute most of the behind-the-scenes controls to the Jesuit order, right. right? And I think we're correct on that, right? They, right. they, they control the Rothschilds and the Rothschild banking. They set up the, the Zionist Congress in, in Basel, Switzerland. They mm. set up the Balfour Declaration in 1917. They even set up the state of Israel in 1948, right? That was all backed by the Rothschilds. And to this day, the Vatican has controlling authority over Jerusalem since the Oslo Accords in 1994. Mm -hmm. So they're pulling the strings, right? So the devil's running the show, and he's running it on a clock that parallels what God already fulfilled in Christ. So he's mm -hmm. creating a false duality. Right, and then he's going to set up a false messiah, which a lot of the Jews are going to fall for. Absolutely, right? and th and think about it like this: he's, it's not just that the devil has created a false reality, like a matrix all around us. Think about That's all right. the wickedness that you learn about in public school, such as evolution, heliocentricity. You know what I mean? Uh, uh all this corrupted math. Okay, which I really don't have time to get into, but is another crucial aspect of how the Jesuits have corrupted science is through this ridiculous of this their their math. It's it's actually math theology, is what I like to refer it to, is math theology. But uh, well, and, we, and we've even talked about virtual reality, all yes. this new technology, all the games, you know, the headsets you can buy now. Yes, and and, and it puts you in a three D world that's not real. But you can't tell it's not real because it looks real. Yeah. So they're yeah. they're pre programming they're advanced programming us all so that they can pull off some kind of false reality and we won't even be able to tell it's not real with our own eyes, right? We're gonna look up into the heavens and see, you know, Project Blue Beam or something that mm -hmm. they're controlling, and we're gonna think that God's doing something when it's them. It's it's just lying signs and wonders, brother. 
Right. Right. So this is where believers need to cling to the scriptures very closely as we near very close to the end times because the deception level is going to go the, the, the meter is going to go off the chart. Through the roof. Right? The scripture says, even if possible, the very elect will be deceived. Right. I mean, th- in, 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 the, yeah. in the Greek tense, it infers that it is possible for believers to be deceived. Right? Yeah. The only way we, we can keep from being deceived is to really know the scriptures well. Amen. Matthew, Matthew 13, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 24 and Mark 13, at the very beginning, what does Jesus tell them? Be ye not deceived. Right. Be ye not deceived. Okay? Because deception is the main tool of the devil. Think about it. It's always big, been his biggest weapon. Think about going back to the garden. It was deception. It was through uh, twisting the word, the God's word. Okay? That he was able to do this. And he, he's not inventive. The devil's not inventive. He's not original. All he can do is copy God because he wants to be like the Most High. That's true. That's truly his intention is to be like Christ. So right, yeah. yeah the, the idea of Antichrist it, it's sort of a dual meaning. It, it is against Christ, but it's also in place of Christ. Right, in place of you know to be a clone and to try and mm-hmm. fake everybody out, and everybody thinks that he is the great deliverer. And he's a good guy. He's the angel of light, the light bearer. That's the whole concept of the Illuminati. Lucifer fell from heaven, you know, like a bolt of lightning, you know. So, so Satan and the, the the Pope and the Black Pope, these people are are pretending to be the light of the world, and they're here standing in place of Christ. They say, mm-hmm. you know, the Vicar of Christ, the person who's actually God on earth, is what he's claiming. This is complete heresy you know, from the Bible. It's complete sin, absolutely, absolutely, brother. So, so. We know that, that Passover uh, has has had a, a great role in history mm-hmm. and applies to us as Christians. Christ is our Passover, and in the future we'll be remembered forever, right? We also know that uh, the Feast of, of Unleavened Bread mm-hmm. was fulfilled, and Christ is our bread come down from heaven. Amen. And, we, and as we, in a way, metaphorically, we're walking through the wilderness right now. We're living by faith. We have struggles. And our major food supply is food coming down from heaven, the Word of God. Yeah, I, I, the Eric John Phelps Show on 24 7 World Radio. Welcome back to the last half hour with uh, Brother Harrison Cox. Harrison, you had a comment you want to make? Oh, yes. Uh, I just want to take uh, just a quick minute and give out my information. If anyone out there, researcher, uh, fellow Bible believer, um, if you want to get in contact with me, my email is 727facebook at gmail.com. That's 727facebook at gmail.com. And you can send me a, a message and we can start to network because any of you young men that are out there that listen to brothers, uh, Brother Eric's broadcast and that you are edified by this information and you've been sitting back maybe idle, not doing much about it but you feel that maybe God has been calling you to step up and do something, um, let this, let, let's, let's make, let's start it here. You know what I mean? Send me an email. Let's, let's talk about some things. Let's network. Um, myself, brother Lewis Heaney, um, you know, we, we are coming on these broadcasts to seek to actually do something and to tell the truth. And I would encourage all young men and and uh, all listeners to, to do the same, whether it be just through supporting Brother Eric uh, financially, or whether it be just through prayers, or whether you actually want to step up and do something. As in, men, brethren, what shall we do? So, <laughs> hey, great words of encouragement. And, and, you know, this is a beautiful thing for us to stimulate one another to love and good works, uh, to inspire each other by example and word and deed. Uh, this is all good, healthy Christian living together. In mm-hmm. a way, you know, the scripture says when two or more are gathered in his name, he's in the midst of us. Amen. So even when we're virtually connected like this, 
this is sort of like a, a legitimate gathering of believers. So we want this to grow. By the way, uh, we think this may uh, take a little bit of a, a step up here soon. Um, there's uh, a meeting coming up here in about a week or so in Virginia, and we're going to be meeting with some uh, Christian men who have an interest in, in building this out in a bigger and more contemporary way. So if we get a little more technology, get a little more tech savvy, um, you know, uh, we, we may be able to improve websites, uh, post, uh, put out some more books. Uh, Brother Katz has about three books in them already that we talked about. <laughs> and I'm sure there's others of you out there that have God's using you in certain ways. You have certain insights that you could share. And so we encourage that. And, and I think this could all grow exponentially. We want to reach millions. Uh, you know, the, our brother in the U.K., has talked about the size of, of the populations across Europe who have no idea of the Jesuit order and what's going on, right? These people are completely blind. We have a little more uh, awareness here, I think, in the United States, even though we feel like much of Protestant Christianity is apostate. There's a lot of individual Christians who are studying and reading and listening and searching and now networking so mm -hmm. so we want this to be a little bit of a focal point and along the line of brother Cott's email also check out my blog it's uh, dudleyradio.wordpress.com and i put all the notes on there from these broadcasts so today we sort of uh uh, boggled our first hour, I think, but I'm going to still put upload a lot of these notes. We have the scripture references and so forth, and hopefully you can benefit from those uh, at your convenience. And that's a free blog you can log on anytime. So let's uh, let's recap the meaning of the of the Feast of Tabernacles, and then in our last few minutes, maybe I can impose on you, Harrison, to to give us sort of a preview of a future topic that you've been researching um, that would be of great interest to many listeners. So, okay, absolutely. So once, let's let's just wrap up our discussion about the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. Uh, with, let, let, me, um, let me talk, uh, give a couple verses here, and then you can add in your, your feedback. Okay. Part of, the, part of the picture of Tabernacles, number one, joy and celebration. It's the final gathering of the of the wheat into the barn, surviving all the trials. This is going to happen at the end of the tribulation period. The remnant will be saved. The Messiah will come in person, and there will be a great celebration. And it goes for seven days, which I think pictures the seventh uh, millennium of world history. <clears throat> history is coming up on the 6,000-year mark, and the millennium will be the 7,000 years. Uh, the last day of the week, so to speak, and it'll be uh, a, a great festival of Thanksgiving. Uh, also, living waters is a big part of the uh, picture of the Feast of Tabernacles. They pray for rain for the coming year, and the rain is a picture of God's blessing. Mm -hmm. He pours out his spirit. You, you know, there's a, a passage, I think, in uh, Malachi that he will open the windows of heaven <laughs> and give you a blessing you can't contain. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is, this is uh, all of what Tabernacles speaks of. And it, it, they are commanded to rejoice, to sing, dance, and, and uh, basically uh, uh, socialize in celebration, in spiritual celebration during this week-long festival. So uh, a total picture of restoration. And we know from Ezekiel 45, as, as Harrison pointed out, uh, Israel, a remnant of Israel, will be restored. And Paul asked the question in the book of Romans, is God done with Israel? God forbid. You know, all Amen. Israel will be saved. And uh, and a lot of us feel that the interpretation of that is that the remnant, those who are chosen, will they will all be saved. Not one, and Jesus said, not one will escape my protection. My sheep hear my voice, and he's going to save every last one of them. Amen. And uh, I think... I think you're right on with it, uh, Brother Robert. And I think if we also look at the Feast of Tabernacles, yes, it was about you know the joy, the joys of the whole year, you know, and the blessings and the latter rain. But there was also an idea of harvest involved in this. Yes. In this, and it was uh, the Feast of Tabernacle was also called the Feast of Ingathering or the Feast of Harvest, and that harvest is the same harvest that is spoken of in Matthew 13. 
where Christ is, is, is giving the parables of the wheat and the tares. And then that's, that's Matthew 13, verses 29 through 30. But then in chapter, thir I mean in verse 39, he explains what he's talking about. And he tells us that the harvest is the end of the world. And the tares, the tares in the field are those sown by the devil, and that the angels are the reapers. Okay, and that and that all these tares are going to be gathered and burned. Okay, and it's you know, and this mirrors you know Christ coming back the the in the Valley of Megiddo. Okay, when he's we know when when he's going to crush the armies of Satan, and the blood's going to flow as high as a horse's bridle. Okay, and you know all the dead bodies. It's gonna it's gonna be a it's gonna be a feast for the birds, the crows, and all, and you know the vultures. You know what I mean? So it's called. It's actually called in Revelation the Great Supper of God Almighty. Yeah, where there'll yeah. be so many dead bodies, all the birds are gonna devour all the. It says the kings of the earth and the great men, you know, and all their horses and all their weapons mm -hmm. all be destroyed. Yeah, this is Armageddon. This is, I believe, it's the uh, ten days. Between the second coming, which is uh, uh, on the Day of Trumpets, Yom Turah, to the Day of Atonement. And those are called the Ten Days of Awe. I believe it's a ten-day campaign, the campaign of Armageddon, mm -hmm. where he comes and executes judgment. And this is the fulfillment of, of Jude, the book of Jude. He will come to execute judgment on all the ungodly for all they've said and done against him. Well, I would, I would also add this brother robert because as we know speaking of the calendar there is something in the jewish calendar called the jubilee year correct uh -huh. right. now in the jubilee year described in leviticus chapter 25 and verse 9 it talks about in the jubilee year that the horn is supposed to be blown on the day of atonement this horn of jubilee was this ram's horn was supposed to i believe it's a shofar i believe is it was supposed to be blown on that day of atonement, so at what you describe as Christ coming, this ten days, you know, it's it it kind of it's very interesting looking at all these things, you know, and what their right. figures and types really are. Absolutely. Now, there's an interesting point at the end of the seven day feast, and this is uh, recorded in um, in Leviticus uh, 23, when it, where it describes the feast. There's an eighth day added to the end of the feast. So you have a seven-day feast with a final eight-day tagged on. It's kind of treated separate. It's not part of the seven-day feast, but it follows immediately after, and it's called the last great day, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe this is a symbol of eternity. So Amen. I think I think what the picture is, is the seven days is the millennial kingdom. It's the 7,000 years of world history. And at the end of that is the great eighth day, that merges into eternity because we know Christ's kingdom will have no end. So it's not a thousand years and then it's over somehow, like annihilation. Some mm -hmm. some people, some religions teach that that there will be no eternity, that everything will be annihilated and turned to nothing. Well, we know that's not correct. Amen. So David's key, the promise to David that is that his son would sit on his throne forever, and of his kingdom there would be no end. So Christ will take the throne of David. I believe on the Day of Atonement, okay, and and he will sit on that king for a thousand years, and then that will merge on the eighth day. The eighth day is a picture of the, a new beginning of a new eon of timelessness, right? This mm -hmm. is beyond time now, and 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 that's why we're told that we will live forever with him, All right, into eternity, amen. Right, right. Now they're now included at the end of that. Millennial Kingdom. We know from the tail end of the book of Revelation, there will be one last hurrah for the devil, and then he will be cast alive into the lake of fire, which will burn forever and ever, and then the great white throne judgment will take place, and that's the second resurrection. That's the final uh, harvest, okay? And at that point, there will be the final separation between the wheat and the chaff. So again, all of this is pictured through this whole Tabernacles uh, festival. Mm -hmm. So, so there's joy, and then there's the final cap at the end, the great eighth great day, and then the, it says living waters will flow out of New Jerusalem. Amen. This is Zechari Zechariah fourteen. Again, like he put in us living waters through mm -hmm. his Spirit. Right. Jesus said, "Out of you, out of you will come living waters." 
And, and then in Revelation 22, he says, the river of life will flow through Jerusalem and 12 kinds of fruit will, will grow. And the first temple, get this, the first temple was dedicated on the eighth day of tabernacles. Okay, this is the, like I just mentioned, the mm-hmm. eighth day. So in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 8 through 10, the, the first temple was dedicated on that day to picture eternity. Right? This is a beautiful thing. You know, Brother Eric, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Brother Robert, it just struck me. as Because the whole time we're talking about this, you know, I, I gleaned much of this from my study of the, uh, the tabernacle of the testimony. Okay, the whole idea of the tabernacle being patterned after creation. Well, in that study you come across, well, throughout the Bible, it speaks of the temple and the, the, the Solomon's temple. And it just struck me that though it, that's, that's a type for Christ's temple, his future temple. That's right. That's it. It's, that's right. That's what well, it is. And, and here's, here's what will probably blow all of our minds if we really think about it. We are all being schooled and being led to the fullness of Christ because it's, it ends in Revelation 21 that in the New Jerusalem there is no temple mm-hmm. because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. So these temples and tabernacles and everything we have as shadows and examples, they're teaching us principles that are fulfilled in the person of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen, that's brother. Where that, that's where it's all going. We're going to live with him forever. He's the temple we're going to worship. That's right. Hey, and You know, as you're speaking, this verse just came to me. Jeremiah 3.16 And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, thee shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall thee remember it. Neither shall thee visit. Neither shall that be done anymore. In verse 17, at that time thee shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. There you go. Okay? And all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord. To Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk anymore after the imagination of their own evil heart. So you, you're, you're exactly right. We see that. That this whole idea of the ark is the idea of the throne of God in heaven. Okay? But when the Lord comes back down to earth to establish his throne here, in the millennial kingdom, there won't be any ark. It says it right here in Jeremiah 3.16. They won't even remember it. It won't right. even come into their mind because Christ is sitting on his throne. Well, okay. and it just reminds me of the passage that Paul uses. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Right? So this is like spiritual growth. Right. When we first learn about God, we learn about tabernacles and temples mm-hmm. and the priesthood. Because those are basic concepts, and right. then God expands on those, and he shows what they're pointing to. They point to the realities in Christ, and eventually we don't need our toys anymore and our models right. and our shadows and our symbols because we got the real thing. That's right. right. Like when you're a kid, you get toys, cars, and stuff. When you're an adult, you get a real car. <laughs> you aren't going to play with your little cars anymore. You're going to go drive your real car. Right. It, it, you know, and that mirrors exactly what, uh, what Paul said in the book of Hebrews, I believe is chapter 5, when he's speaking of milk for the believers and that, that, most, that most believers aren't, aren't ready for strong meat. That, right. they can't get, that if they're given strong meat, they won't know what to do with it because strong meat is for those who have had their senses exercised by, you know, by studying and reading and you know, their faith in the word of God. Yeah, right. exactly. Absolutely. Well, if, if if you're good with this, let's switch gears and uh, and talk kind of in a preview kind of way okay. about a, complete, a completely different subject. Yes, um, that's something you've been working on, and maybe mention a little bit of your family background that led you to this, and give us a, your topic that you're working on. Okay, we hope to do a whole program on this uh, in the near future. Yes. Um, okay. So, yeah. Again, switching gears. Um, in my study, in, in many of my studies, I have come across something that um, I, I believe the Lord has led me in my conclusions in this. And um, in my, as, as a kid, let me start here. As a kid, when uh, growing up, I was born into a family that was involved in Scientology. Um, I was only involved with it up until about four or five years old, right before I went into uh, like kindergarten, first grade. 
and I never had any dealings with it after that, but it always left a strong impression in my life, and even my father to this day, he's he's uh, he's like a closet Scientologist. He doesn't go to their quote-unquote church, but you know he still believes in their ideas and principles. So this is something that's always been in, you know, I guess you could say a part of my life, a part of my memories, and it's only been within the last year or two that the Lord has just really been pushing me to understand what and who this organization of Scientology really is. Who they are, who established them, and for what purpose. And um, there's no, I mean, I'm not even going to beat around the bush with this, Brother Robert. I'm just going to come out and tell everybody that according to my research, and I have right of, uh, as of now about 23 to 25 solid reasons why or how the Church of Scientology is patterned after the Society of Jesus. Okay, and um, it's very interesting when you when you start looking at just some of the just the simple similarities. I mean, I can go over them pretty just a couple pretty quick here without getting into too much detail. So, you have of course the Scientology and the Society of Jesus. Well, the uh, Scientology's founder, L. Ron Hubbard, he was an ex-military man who supposedly was injured in war. Well, we see that with Ignatius Loyola. He was an ex-military man who was injured in war. All right. Also, um, uh, Hubbard, his 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 name was known as the source. He was because he was the source for all this 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 data, this religion, and he demands absolute obedience. And there's no freedom of conscience or private judgment in Scientology. Well. I mean, Loyola was known as the superior general, and he demands absolute obedience from his Jesuits. And there's no freedom of conscience or private judgment either. You know, they are to be as a as a, a walking stick in the hand of a dead man, I believe it is described. And it's the same it's it's the same thing with Scientology. So I mean I could go through this. There is, you know, outwardly Scientology is a religious order, quote unquote, but secretly and currently they're a paramilitary order. Okay? Just like the Jesuits. Outwardly, they're a religious order, but secretly and currently, they're a military order. You know, uh, they both use hypnosis and meditations to mind control the people who get involved in this. And now, in this study, I want to bring something up that I don't think is talked about a whole lot. Is that the, the, the Jesuits, they're just being mind controlled. Okay, you Jesuits, you you low-level Jesuit priests that you may be listening to this program, I feel sorry for you because you've gotten yourself involved in this contemplative prayer and these spiritual exercises, which have done nothing, which they're nothing but guided trance and hypnosis. That's all they are. You're being mind-controlled, and you're being used to further the devil's end and to further the, uh, the black pope's end. So much like the Scientologists who get involved with that religious order are being mind controlled. The Jesuits, the Jesuit, the all you Jesuit novices, get out, run away, don't stay, don't don't do any, don't do another day of your thirty day spiritual exercises. You know, get away from there because you're being you're being brainwashed, and this is the original brainwashing technique is the spiritual exercises. So. Um, let's see. Let's let's just look at a couple more little points. Okay, so Scientology has things called organizations. That's where they t train and take their Scientology courses. Well, that's just like a Jesuit novitiate. You know, uh, Scientology has a form of excommunication. Uh, they have a policy called fair game policy that uh, that kind of mimics the Council of Trent and the Counter Reformation, which means destroy all enemies, and it gives them it gives them a carte blanche to do so. Um, let's see. All right, the, uh, the, the, the tech of Scientology and Dianetics, it's used to create slaves, okay? But likewise, Loyola developed the spiritual exercises to create the masters for the slaves. You see? All right, now, uh, let's see, uh, Scientology has an ethics office with their ethics officers, quote-unquote. Well, that's, that's, that's what the Office of the Inquisition and its inquisitors are. All right, both, both have a, uh, 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 internally have a very heavy emphasis on the group or the hive mind, both of them. Both are extremely ecumenical. 
I mean, Scientology is the epitome of an almost atheist religion that is completely ecumenical. All right. The Jesuit order, of course, has their interfaith dialogue, and they're working on, you know, all this uh, ecumenic ecumenicism since Vatican II. They're the ones that are behind all this in all right. the Catholic Church. Uh, Scientology is 100% work salvation, just like Catholicism and just like Jesuitism. All right. Um, Scientology and, uh, well, really, Hubbard developed a quote-unquote study, study technology for Scientologists, so you can go to a Scientologist school and get a Scientologist education. Okay? And this mirrors Loyola and his successors developing the quote-unquote Jesuit curriculum so that you can get a Jesuit education at one of any of the, I think, it, what, is, what is it, 28 major uh, mm -hmm. Jesuit universities in this country and, you know, right. many more all over the world. That's you right. know, Scientology also is worldwide. It has uh, it has main offices or, or ideal orgs in Brussels, in Rome, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. I mean, they're all over. They're, they're on every continent. Okay, so they're, again, international and... Well, and I thought it was interesting, you were telling me the other day, they're very strategic in how they try and be in, in certain areas, like where you grew up. You grew up in a, in a community that is a very sensitive, major military community. Oh, yes, yeah. Thank you, Brother Robert, for bringing that up. Let me just say this to anybody out there listening in Pinellas County, in mid -Flo uh, it's, uh, central Florida, it's where Clearwater is. It's where St. Petersburg is. That uh, Clearwater, Florida is Scientology's main hub. That's where I was born and raised in that area. Uh, let me just say to everybody in Clearwater, uh, anybody in Clearwater will be able to tell you this. The uh, Scientology owns all almost all of downtown. Okay, they, they own it all. They just built a, a, a humongous cathedral. That it's, it's a building which they call a Scientology cathedral, by the way. Um, they just built this humongous monstrosity for more uh, mind control and manipulation, and and they and they probably picked that area because of the military. Presence. Absolutely, because by air, as as the crow flies, it is not even twenty miles away from McDill Air Force Base. Okay, and, and, and mention what that McDill, facility is. McDill key. Air Force Base is the head for military intelligence in the continental continental United States. Okay, McDill is the hub. It's a uh, special ops command is headquartered there. Uh, there. If you go online and and look up the Wikipedia and just look at all the things that are located at McDill, it is a D matter of fact. They just started a DIA training school there. Okay, so McDill is heavy with military intelligence. They're only twenty, about twenty miles away. You know, forty forty five minute drive away from a. Uh, from downtown Clearwater, where the Scientologists have set up shop, and that's their spiritual headquarters. Clearwater is like the mecca for Scientology. Now, I think this could be huge that God's using you to kind of pull the curtain back on this. My understanding is that MacDill is the center for what they call the Southern Command, yes. which, as I understand, uh, controls all of Latin America, which historically was Jesuit controlled, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And I think they have a pretty tight connection to the Middle East. Don't they run most of the Middle East operations out of Southern Command? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, too sure about that one, Robert. I'm not exactly sure about as far. I just, I just know that if you go online, I'm, I'm sure you'd be able to find that with a little legwork, with a little research. I'm sure you'd be able to confirm that. Yeah, yeah we'll check that out. Yeah, we'll have but to look down. into that. We're, we're down to two minutes, but I think our listeners can get a little taste that this is a topic worth exploring at length. Maybe yes. another two-hour program we could do soon. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and to understand what the Jesuits are doing with, uh, you know, I usually associate uh, Scientology with Hollywood because of mm -hmm. some of the high-profile actors who are known to be Scientologists. But, but I look forward to your work on this. I think God could use you in a tremendous way to expose this and for listeners out there to tell their friends, anybody involved in Scientology. I, I, I've met people who wanted to get out of Scientology, and it's very hard to get out of. Yes, it is. That's another, another side to it. It's like the mafia. Once you're in, you can't leave, you know? Yeah. So clearly, this is a topic that needs to be addressed. hasn't been talked about on this program, and I um, think it hasn't been talked about anywhere, brother. Right? Yeah, right. nowhere. So, 
Well, thank you, uh, Harrison, for your great input today. The hour went too quick, and we yes, kind of botched the first hour, but hopefully we'll do better in the future. Yeah, Lord, <laughs> so, Lord uh, willing, yes. God bless you, and everybody uh, look Seven forward to this. Your source for the truth. From Peter Story News <laughs> in London, I'm... <laughs>